So my presentation is called Software as a First Class Output in a Fair Ecosystem. Um, and I will cover a few different subjects. So I have a few a, a different, different hats on today. So I'm a software engineer and a metadata specialist in the Software Heritage uh, Initiative at the INRE Research Center in Paris, France. I'm also uh, representing the INRE Research Center on the first fair um, project, European project. And I'm also a co-chair of the uh, joint RDA, RISA, and 411 Fair for Research Software Working Group. And I'm kind of going to um, propose to you a presentation today that will cover different subjects that will um, kind of integrate software preservation, uh, research software, and uh, FAIR, FAIR software. So let's go and jump into this um, presentation. So first, uh, with a short introduction of research software as a first class output, then why research software archiving is important. Um, I will continue with the software heritage universal source code archive and uh, software in a fair ecosystem. And finally, I will also present you some of the work we are doing on the fair for research software working group, show you how all these dots are connected and are important. So first, software in research has multiple uh, facets as well, like my uh, roles here. Um, software is also uh, have different uh, roles. It can be a tool, it can be a research outcome of the research process, and it can be the object of research. It's important to make it a first class output, which is in the process of being a first class output, because in a few years ago, we would say that it wasn't, and it was a forget, forgotten pillar next to the publications in open access repository and data sets in the open data set repositories that software is forgotten, but now it's becoming more and more um, on as a, um, a first class, a first class output. Um, the just to show you a few a few examples of important landmarks in research software and software um, importance of software. Software source code is also very special and it not, it's not just data. It evolves over time and projects may uh, last decades. The key to its understanding is the history of development. It can be very complex from a few lines of code but many lines of code as well. And it may have a large web of the dependencies. So talking about one software might not be talking about all the, the requirements that this software really needs to be um, maintained and sustained um, for the long term. And it might have a sophisticated developer community. This is why it is important to preserve the source code because the source code is human readable and it is executable knowledge. Programs must be written for people to be read and only incidentally for machines to execute. The source code provides a view into the mind of the designer. It's important to keep this in mind, even if we want to reuse software and mostly when we want to reuse software, it might be already a machine execu executable, um, the knowledge is in the source code. Why are we here? There are a plurality of needs in the scholarly ecosystem where researchers need to reference their software, to get credit for this software, to find useful software, and to verify or reproduce results. The laboratories of those team and, and teams want to track software contributions and produce reports. And finally, the research organization, they want to know their software assets. And this is part of a scholarly ecosystem that we want to uh, make also a fair, a fair ecosystem. And this is important. Research software ar archiving is important, but why? Because it can be lost. It is fragile, it can be damaged. There's mm, different ways for it to be um, to not stay where it was yesterday. So some examples 
can be destroyed. For example, Google's killed Google code and uh, Bitbucket um, decided to sunset the Mercurial support just last year. And luckily, um, Software Heritage was here to take a part in this um, um, continuation of the access to this source code. So hosting your open source project is on a free publicly available platform is completely fine and it's good. It's good that you will do that because it is important to, to have it in a public repository if you have open source uh, software. But you have to prepare a plan B. And why it's important to prepare a plan B? Also because the version control systems uh, changes now, the most um, popular, I don't have it on this slide, but we did an analysis, most popular is Git. Um, we had some different version control system before Git, and we might have that different version control system after Git. So we need to address this also when we archive source code. And th this is why I want to present to you Software Heritage with the aim to collect, preserve, and share all software source code to preserve the heritage, enabling better software and better, better research for all. So if you see these uh, charts that were taken in June 2021, we have grown since 2016 when Software Heritage has just launched. Um, and we have now more than 161 million projects. Uh, I'm not going to click on this link even though I wanted to do a tour, but I don't have the time, so I'm going to just um, tell you a few things. Uh, Software Heritage is archiving different um, forges, uh, package managers, and um, even scholarly repositories like HAL um, and publisher like I the iPod journal. Uh, Software Heritage is rescuing software. As I told you before, soft source code is fragile. Google, Google code is now safely in Software Heritage, also the Mercurial uh, repositories. And save code, saving code is for everyone. It's not only for your code, saving your code, but also saving other people's code. Because like the Internet Archive, you can just use a URL on this save code now interface, and it will fetch the uh, publicly available code into Software Heritage the same way it does with uh, web pages for the Internet Archive. The advantages, it, it, it's uh, saving the complete development history. And you can use different uh, URLs from different platforms, uh, Git, Mercurial, and uh, SVN types uh, of repositories. And then you can use uh, SWID, which is a persistent identifier, a software heritage persistent identifier, which is intrinsic. It's like a digital fingerprint of the object itself, and you can um, reference very different parts in the different granularities of your source code or for any other source code that, it's, that is archived on Software Heritage. These identifiers are decentralized. They do not need a registry. You can also compute them on your machine if you want a suite. You don't need Software Heritage for that. And they are cryptographically strong identifiers. So this is the end of the uh, preservation part and the software heritage part of my uh, presentation. They, there are so many things I want to tell you, but you should go to the archive and um, discover by yourself. We have a very nice how-to guide. I've put a link in the uh, notes. We also have for, um, for cultural heritage, we have the software heritage uh, acquisition process which is specifically for legacy software. But I didn't have the time to tell you all about that today. So go, you have many things to discover there. And moving on to the FAIR ecosystem with my FAIR's FAIR hat on, we want to build bridge, a bridge or many bridges between these communities, between software development communities and research software communities and the FAIR communities, which are um, have the same goal to uh, improve software um, curation and quality. 
Um, software, as I said before, in the beginning, software is not just another type of data. We have these two recommendations that um, uh, support that. We need to recognize that uh, fair, the FAIR guidelines, the FAIR guiding principles should be translated to other digital objects and make sure the specific nature of software is recognized and not considered as just data, particularly in the context of discussion about the notion of FAIR data. And we want it to, to be known that software is everywhere in the FAIR ecosystem. If you look at this nice image of the FAIR ecosystem, you can see a, a few um, icons that I've used for uh, suggesting there's software there. Software is behind a lot of things. It's behind services, it's behind repositories. To have a repository running, it's software that's behind it, the registries, also software is behind it, but th there's the digital objects, which are the software outputs. And somewhere um, next to that, there's the tools that are not the research um, outputs, but are used during the research. So software is really everywhere and we need to keep that in mind. And the, the complexity of, of software is also important to keep in mind. Um, last year, we've uh, done in Fair's Fair um, a report, the assessment report on fairness of software and a webinar decoding the fair principles. This preliminary work that was very useful during our work as the Fair for Research Software Working Group, which I'm going to come to now. So with my third hat on, the Fair for Research Software Working Group. So I'm, I'm a co-chair, but we are many co-chairs, Very each of us is contributing to this working group actively. And I really want to acknowledge each uh, working group chair uh, Paola, Carlos, Michelle, Dan, Leila, Neil, Fortis, and Jen, and also acknowledge all the almost 228, it was a few weeks ago, it was 228 members that are contributing to the, uh, this working group. Uh, the timeline started in September 2020 when it was endorsed by RDA. So I said it in the beginning, but I'm going to repeat it. It's a joint working group. Uh, of Force 11 and RDA and the uh, ERISA uh, task force. Uh, between September 2020 and let's say March 2021, the subgroups uh, one, two, three, and four worked. I'm not going to detail that because I don't want to take up too much time. This work has ended. You can see a lot of things that we have done on the RDA page and we have many videos out there, including one that I'm going to show you in the next slide, uh, a fair for research software webinar, which is much more detailed than what I'm going to tell you today. And uh, recently in June, we have released a um, the um, fair for research software principles that I will show you in the next uh, few slides. And now we started the, five, the fifth, sixth, and seventh uh, subgroups, which are more focused on adoption. And yet, I will discuss that in a, in a in the next slide. So, first, the development of the fair fair for research software principles, the intent and methods of the fair guiding principles, took two points as starting points. We wanted to maximize the added value gain by contemporary formal scholarly digital publishing and make software a first class output alongside publications and data. And another starting point was to ensure transparency, reproduci reproducibility and reusability, which is a very focal, focal point of the Fair for Research Software principles because R is reuse, but the definition of reuse is a bit more complicated with software. The FAIR principles are aspirational and FAIR is not binary, so it's not you are FAIR or not FAIR. We aim to improve software and the research or scholarly ecosystem by having fair, fairer software, but it's not binary. Software encompasses many forms which may benefit different users. So there's the users and the creators, there's the people that depends on the software, for example, different creation that are uh, require, 
required to run a specific software. And uh, as I said in the beginning, the knowledge in, is in the source code. So it is often the most useful form to understand the software and also the easiest form to apply the fair for research software principles. And many software engineering practices are relevant to the fair for research software principles. So that here is the bridge between those communities. We want this to be aligned, not to uh, create a divergence between those communities, but really work together to improve software and research. So this slide is very packed and I'm not going to read it. It's the fair principles for research software as were defined by the fair for research working group in this 2021 um, publication, which is available online on the LDA webpage. It's also described and discussed thoroughly in the uh, fair for research software LDA webinar. Here is the link, I also put the link in the notes of um, the uh, collaborative notes. Um, I think that people that know the FAIR principles will see that the differences are not major, but there are some interesting facts that can be taken into consideration. Um, uh, specifically, um, um, this air two software includes qualified represent to other software, which is completely new in the respect of the fair data principles. But again, I will let you read that uh, calmly uh, in your own time and maybe watch the fair for research software webinar, which was very, very nicely um, and where it's very nicely um, described by Neil Chu Hong. And then there's also um, um, Carlos and, and Dan that have a part of that webinar describing the working group and activities. And we know that FAIR is um, as a specific part to improve software, but FAIR is not the end goal. It is a step. And as it is not binary, also the end goal isn't binary. And there are many steps where to, to this end goal where all software is robust, all software is reproducible, all software is sustainable, and all software or all most software is also open source. And finally, all software source code is archived, maybe on scholarly uh, archive, but also on software heritage. So there are steps that are beyond, beyond FAIR that can't be included in the FAIR principles. To get more engagement in the FAIR for research software working group, we have these three new subgroups that started in the beginning of September. So it's still, you have still time to join if you want to. Um, we have subgroup five um, working on adoption guidelines identify, create, review existing resources that facilitate the adoption of the fair for research software principles. We have subgroup six um, about adoption support, um, ident identify and start to work with organization following the fair for research software guidelines, um, uh, stimulate adoption of the fair for research software guidelines and document and share example of these adoptions and plans. And finally, there's subgroup seven about governance to create communications plan and content that clutter post release governance structure. So you can join in this form or directly email one of the chairs of each one of the subgroups. There's a lead for each one of the subgroups or two leads. Uh, it's not written here, but all, all the information is available on the RDA page. And in this, and you can also use this form and come and join the effort. So to wrap up, I did it quick, quicker than I expected. <laughs> I, I felt like I have uh, <laughs> someone a uh, fire behind me. Um, so I'm sorry if it was too quick, but I think that you got everything that I wanted to say today. Even though there are many things that I want to say to you, and I didn't have the the time, or I didn't think that to have the time to tell you about, but. Uh, maybe in the next uh, presentation. For, for now, to wrap up, um, what's important is to archive source code as much as possible. 
uh, Software Heritage is doing that uh, uh, proactively. So there are many repositories out there that are proactively archived in Software Heritage. You don't just need to do a save code now, but the save code now is kind of um, uh, putting a um, um, uh, heads up. So we'll do it quicker in a few minutes in, uh, and not come to it after a long weeks and months. So this is uh, important to know. The second point from this talk is that you should, or if you are interested in fair for research author, you, you can join uh, the working group, even if it's just uh, read the emails and receive the updates. Uh, you can be more active and contribute to the subgroup's work and uh, follow. There's a lot of ev events where the uh, working group is presenting, where we, we get feedback from the community. So, you, you should follow that and, and come along. Uh, the third point is to adopt good practices to develop fair software. So I didn't show a lot of good practices, even though I'm a metadata specialist and I could have shown you some good practices about metadata, but I will give you uh, two, two vocabularies that you should follow. You should follow code meta and you should follow citation.cff. And if you have one or both in your repository, then I will be happy when citing or uh, needing metadata for indexing because we are indexing both file e files in Software Heritage. So metadata is something important. And finally, let's spread the word as a, a community and start, even if we already started, but continue recognizing software in academia. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and I hope to see you soon. <laughs>